Hey, River of Life Church, we come today to our final in this series called Seven, A Lifestyle of Making Disciples. And this has been a cracking series. We have kicked off 2022 with this series, and it's really been a rallying cry that has got us out of the apathy and passivity of lockdown, shutdown, and COVID 2021 stuff, and got us moving in a whole new way as a church into 2022. I've been thrilled with the response across the church. I've been thrilled with the quality of the preaching and content and delivery, and thrilled with the buy-in and the participation of the church as a whole. So today, we come to number seven, and I'm sure up in our uh, different venues will just simply be the logo with the diamond, number seven, and we've looked at the top three facets, which are the three expressions of in the building. Uh, things that we can do practically in the building. And we've looked at small group, large group, and give group or generosity. And then the three facets of the diamond on the bottom half, the three expressions of the church in the world, out there, and that being in family, in workplace, and beyond our comfort zone. And how Jesus did this with his disciples, and Paul did it with Timothy. Uh, These six dynamics working together, small group, large group, generosity group, in family, in the workplace, and out of our comfort zone. And we come today to the one that goes through the center, the actual epicenter, the, the source of life for all of this. And it's looking at the aspect of the word and prayer. And so we're going to pray together right now, and we're going to dive into the first chapter of Timothy once again, and we're going to see, we're going to refresh ourselves as to these different facets and then drill down into the Word and prayer itself. Lord Jesus, thank you that you never call us to some religious ceremony or to tag you on to our lives. Instead, you call us to lay our lives down as you did for us that the whole of our lives would be about being made a disciple and making disciples of others. You call us to a lifestyle of making disciples in small group, in large group, in generosity, in our family, in our workplace, beyond our comfort zone. And today, as we look at this aspect of in our time of receiving your word and expressing to you in prayer. Father, I pray that the result of this message would be real clarity on what it is to be made a disciple, how to follow you more wholeheartedly, and also what it is to make disciples of others and to more intentionally influence and bear fruit in what you've called us to do. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have looked through uh, the books of First and Second Timothy as we've approached this series called Seven, A Lifestyle of Making Disciples, and we've used the first chapter of Timothy as the key to the books of 1 and 2 Timothy. The themes that come through in the first chapter of Timothy are then seen in the rest of the chapters of First and Second Timothy. And today I'll just take us on a whistle-stop tour of 1 Timothy 1, and then we're going to look at a few more scriptures in 1 and 2 Timothy around the issue of the word and prayer. But if you remember, 1 Timothy 1 verse 1 is the ultimate small group. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus, our hope to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Straight at the outset, this lifestyle of making disciples is mirrored or modeled by Paul to Timothy in these intimate, close relationships, modeled by God Himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And He draws us into that one-on-one relationship with Him. It's, it's no good really to know Psalm 23 if you don't know the shepherd Himself. So knowing about God, knowing things about Christ, isn't actually what eternal life is about. Eternal life 
is about knowing Christ Himself, that small group, the intimacy of relationship. Then verse 3, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge certain persons not to teach any doctrine different or devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculation. He moves to this broad canvas of cities and regions and doctrines and genealogies. That's, that's referring to whole histories and narratives over ages. We're called in Christ to, to follow Jesus and make others follow of, followers of Jesus, not just in small group influence, but also in large group influence, to be part of the body of Christ, to be committed on the broad scale of things, to care about what's happening in Harare, what's happening in Zimbabwe, what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening in Brazil. Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Go and make disciples of all nations. So he calls us from intimacy to breadth, to diversity. And then we looked at uh, this whole aspect of generosity. The aim of our charge is love. That issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some people swerving from these have wandered into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers but not knowing what they're talking about. This reality that we live in a world that is essentially selfish. Being made a disciple and making disciples of others will involve generosity. Generosity with our time, generosity with our talents, generosity with our treasure. The goal of this charge is love from a pure heart, that our lives would be used to spread the knowledge of the love of Jesus. And then those that concluded the in the building three, or the top three on the diamond, small group, large group, give group, and then how does this work out in life? And we looked at family, and I remember Moose preaching on this uh, the, the law is for the ungodly and the lawless, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, perjurers, liars. And we just looked at how the family unit is so broken, and brokenness generally generates brokenness. The absolute importance of the body of Christ outworking principles of Jesus, being a disciple in our family, and making disciples of our families, being intentional about sharing God's Word, and being able to say sorry, and everything that goes into following Jesus as a family member, and helping others to do the same. And then we looked at the workplace. He has appointed me, verse 13, into His service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent. And we looked at our words, our actions, and our attitudes in the workplace. How we can so easily have words that compromise our discipleship and making disciples of others. So often have actions that compromise our being made a disciple and witness to making disciples of others and attitudes that do the same. And then last week, Andrew Ellis, beyond our comfort zone, uh, verse 18 to 20, I charge you to wage good warfare, holding faith and good conscience. Some rejecting this have shipwrecked their faith. And the reality that this is what it's all about. If we hold firm to these things against all the pressures and difficulties, we're going to have a reward, and we're going to finish with that in a moment today. That heaven awaits. We're going to stand before Jesus, and what will count on that day is the extent to which we have followed Jesus, we have been a disciple, and the extent to which we have caused others to follow Him and be disciples of Him. That is what is going to last forever. The bride of Christ is the only part of this created world that will retain any eternal value in the new heavens and the new earth. And that's a reality. So today we come to this last section of Timothy 1, Timothy 1, that we haven't looked at yet, and it's this verse 14 to 17. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance 
that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me the foremost, Jesus Christ, may display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. We see here in very striking way the seventh part of the diamond. This number seven going right through the middle of it, right through the middle of 1 Timothy, right through the middle of 1 Timothy 1. And everything that he's written is this relationship with God by his word and that relationship expressed back to God in prayer. And I'd like us to have a quick look at some other passages here that highlight this. For example, uh, if you go across to 2 Timothy chapter 3, very famous passage, verse 10, it says, you, will have, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. You followed my persecutions and sufferings at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you've learned and, be firmly, and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus." All Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. And I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing in kingdom, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry." For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. As you read... 1 Timothy as a whole and 2 Timothy as a whole, you will see this lifestyle of making disciples oozing out. How Paul engaged with Timothy, his encouragement to Timothy on the different elements, these seven elements that we've spoken about. But this element, the seventh, receiving of the word and prayer, is the power source for discipleship. It is the power source for being made a disciple, and it is the power source for making disciples of others. I'd love us to have a look at a couple of key ways that we are to receive the Word and to reflect back to God in prayer. The first is that this is to be a transaction deep in our hearts personally when no one else is around. The apostle says this to Timothy. This is a trustworthy saying, verse 15, and deserving of full acceptance. In other words, Timothy, I want you to take time to think over this yourself and to weigh up, is this worthy of full acceptance? Is this worthy of you placing your very life upon it? 
It's a transaction that happens deep in the heart. In 2 Timothy, similarly, it says, um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, the verse we've just read, says, But as for you, continue in what you've learned and what you have firmly believed. There's a sense in which we have to get to a place if we are ever going to be disciples of Jesus and if we're ever going to make disciples of others that we need to come to firm belief. We need to be steadfast, robust, immovable, settling in our hearts that God's Word is the final authority not only in our lives but in the universe that God holds all things together by the power of His Word. That His Word has supremacy in our lives. Jesus' name is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, capital W. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word dwelt among us. The Word became flesh. Jesus is the Word made flesh. There is nothing higher than the Word of God. We may not understand it all. We may have lots of questions. There may be all sorts of opposition to what we read, but we settle that God's Word is our final authority. We firmly believe that His Word says it. I believe it. That settles it. There will be many things that we don't understand until we are with Him one day. And if ever you get to the place where you understand everything in the Bible and you understand everything about God, be assured that you're in heresy. Be assured that you're in some flaky crackpot group that thinks they've got God worked out. If you still have tensions and queries and can't quite understand it, but know that He is good, that He's full of grace and truth, that Jesus is the outshining of the radiance of the glory of God, and we want to get to know more, you're in a safe place. He is the potter. We are the clay. So that's the first thing, a, a transaction deep in our hearts where we settle that God's Word is to be firmly believed, knowing His Word. The sacred writings, as Second Timothy calls this. And this is, this is probably the toughest thing is to find a place in our daily lives where we can read God's Word alone or in context of real intimacy. I enjoy reading God's Word on my own. I enjoy reading God's Word with my family. I enjoy reading God's Word in a small group setting. But never doing in a small group setting what I don't do on my own. There's something about, as Jesus calls it, closing the door, and your Father who sees you in secret hears. And that's the same for prayer. This transaction happens deep in our hearts, reading God's Word and praying. And you'll notice here in the passage that we read from 1 Timothy that it says, having received for me the foremost sinner, Paul talking, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example for those who were to believe, as he says that, he goes into verse 17, to the King of ages, immortal and invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Our times of reading God's Word, receiving His Word and truth, should be times of reflecting back to Him praise, honor, glory, and prayer. To the King of all ages, the King eternal. I, I usually sit in the mornings as I read Scripture, and I love to start with prayer. I love to sit and open my hands like this by myself and say, Lord Jesus, I open my heart to the teaching of your Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate what I'm about to read, that you would help me to hear not only with my eyes and ears, but with my heart, that I would be receptive to your word. For your glory, I pray this in Jesus' name. And I go to the text and I read the text. I read a couple of chapters each day. I try to read through the Bible every year. And I'm doing Bible journey as well at the moment. And a number of us in the church are doing that. And I've included that in my devotional times. 
And at the end of that, taking time to say to the King of glory, the King of ages, I express to God in ways from the bottom of my heart. I started praying in tongues as a 17-year-old at Peterhouse School in the boarding hostel by just running out of words of praise. And I just said, Lord, I love you. I thank you. Just prayed from my spirit, expressing, as the scripture says, with moans and groans that words cannot express. The spirit interceding for my spirit, worshiping God and praising him for who he is going into the day from that base. And one thing is for absolute certain, I don't turn on my cell phone until I've had this time with the Lord. The moment the phone goes on, there's distraction. Keep that door closed. Keep this transaction happening deep, deep, deep in your heart. I'm not a person who drinks tea and coffee, so I don't even have tea, coffee. This is where I go first. This is my daily bread. But I don't have it against anyone if... if coffee helps you, if tea helps you, great, if hot water, it's being with the king of the universe and knowing that we have a father-son relationship with the living God. I love what it says here, uh, make you wise for salvation through Jesus Christ and, and the way that Paul exalts God. He doesn't pray some rote prayer. It comes from the bottom of his heart. I want to encourage us as we read God's word in the secret place, as we pray in the secret place, not to be religious, to be ourselves. Just like Paul was writing, he says, I was the worst of sinners, but God did this so that everybody might believe. Because if he's done it for me, he can do it for everyone. And then he just breaks off into prayer. To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, be honor and glory for you. He just breaks into prayer. Be real. These are not babbling words. We don't, we don't come to God in prayer and say, oh, Heavenly Father, King of, you know, and wipe our brow and shout and scream. Just be ourselves. Be ourselves. Praying to our Heavenly Father. Just two more points. First is we receive God's word and reflect back to him in prayer as a deep transaction of the heart. The second one is a transaction between followers and leaders. It's so interesting from this text that Paul consistently says, I'm the one who passed this on to you. He says here, this is a trustworthy saying deserving of full acceptance. He gives his own testimony. God did this in me to be an example for you. Later on in 2 Timothy, he does the same. He says in verse 14, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings. This is such an important thing for us that from the secret place of reading God's word and prayer, the next level of receiving God's word and reflecting back in prayer is in context where we have trust between the followers and the leaders. It's vital that we don't just tap into whatever's coming from the outback of Australia or someone who's got some prophecy in Paraguay or someone who's halfway between Belarus and Estonia and coming through with some message. We have no relationship with these people. The problem with Satan is he's so clever. He is the angel of light, and he, 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 he deceives by having 95% truth, sometimes 99% truth and 1% off. A river of life doesn't pretend to be able to preach 100% truth. We don't pretend to understand all mysteries, but we do propose to have real relationships where together we hear God's word. We're shaped by one another. It's a New Testament expression of hearing God's word and reflecting back to God, glory to his name. And that's going to be a challenge in this age that we're going into with increasing virtuality, that we kind of disconnect from real connection. 
And I want to encourage you to be part of a church where you can receive from leaders and influence leaders, where leaders and followers can hear God's Word together. I want you to know that after I preach, I get feedback from those who've heard, those who've listened. I'm constantly buffeted and challenged by people immediately in the front row as I preach, by elders who I meet with weekly, and by senior leadership team. And we review the preaching of the past to improve. I'm studying. Our, our preachers are studying constantly. We, that's the church you're part of. Get part of a church that's serious about God's Word. Don't just connect into the ether and have no relationship with the body of Christ. And then the third one, and each one of these are so important, but this third one is vitally important. It's a transaction between the follower and others. One of the best ways to hear God's Word, to reflect back to God in prayer, is to do so by leading others to do the same. So the Apostle says to Timothy here, I received mercy for me as the foremost that he may display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. This is the purpose of our lives, to be an example, to reflect, to display that others can come to have eternal life as well. This is the heart of what seven is all about in a lifestyle of making disciples. Second Timothy is perhaps even more challenging on this. It says uh, that you become wise for salvation through faith in Christ. All Scripture is breathed by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. And, and that can be received personally, so it's useful for me being taught, me being corrected, me being trained for righteousness. But just in case you think that the story ends there, and that hearing God's Word and reflecting back to Him in prayer ends with just receiving, Paul is absolutely clear in verse 17, that the man of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. So if we're unable to express the gospel, unable to express the Word of God, to express prayer to God, just like he did now and broke off into prayer in the middle of it, we're not equipped for the good works that he's called us to. And he's called us to those good works in a diversity of callings. Some in Hulstead, some in Zimplat, some in homes, some on the church staff, some cleaning uh, houses, some mowing lawns, some driving taxis. We're all called to diverse things and in every walk of life to shine the knowledge of the gospel of God. I want to encourage you, river of life, that seven, the hearing of God's word and reflecting back to him in prayer, happens as a deep connection of the heart. It happens as a deep connection between followers and leaders. And it happens as a deep intentionality to influence others with the same. As we do that, we will hear not just with our physical ears and see with our physical eyes God's Word, but we will hear with the eyes and ears of our hearts. We will firmly believe. And this will result in prayer and praise and honor to Him. I found that as I pray at the end of my prayer times, I very often, uh, after praise, will request specific requests before God. And the things that I'm most anxious about, I dare to write down. And it's a discipline that has served me so well. I will often go days and days worrying about something because I haven't actually prayed about it. I'm sort of praying, I'm sort of poking at it in prayer. There comes a time in that secret place where I say, Lord, I'm worried about this and I pray that this may happen. I pray for this and I write it down. I have never in my experience as a follower of Jesus, known a prayer that I've prayed in that manner unanswered. Often not answered in the way I asked, but answered nonetheless. Answered 
in a way that takes my anxiety away. That secret place can then be expressed in a broader setting. And draw your family into that. Draw your small group into that. Share your understanding of God's Word and delight in prayer in any small group setting that you're part of. And then share it in a bigger platform. We love the gifts of the Spirit on a Sunday morning. We're eager for prophecy, eager for healing, eager for interpretation of tongues. All of this will come out of knowing Him and stepping out in smaller group settings, learning as we go. It's so exciting. Better to pray for 5, 10, 15 people who are sick and see one or two of them healed than not to pray at all. And I'm hoping that my success rate in prayer for healing is going to increase. I just had some amazing testimonies from Mozambique this last week. And it was interesting, being in a foreign nation, people see me and my love for Jesus, and they say, please, can you pray for these sick people? I prayed for them, and half of them got healed. I was like, I must, I must do more of this. And all of it has to come out of this sincere relationship of integrity of the heart. And so we finish our series called Seven with the very last words of Second Timothy. Verse 18 says, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into His heavenly kingdom. To Him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So he, he breaks off again into a quick prayer there. He says, He is going to rescue me. To Him be the glory forever and ever. And then he goes, Greet Pris Prisca and Aquila, the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained in Corinth, and I left Trophimus, when, who was ill at Miletus. Do your best to come to me before winter. Eubulus sends greetings to you, as do Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. And you can see just in these last verses, never mind the first chapter of Timothy, never mind the whole of the book of 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, just in these last verses, this is the same lifestyle of discipleship. It's small group. Do you see these intimate relationships, Prisca and Aquila? It's large group, Corinth, Miletus. It's that broad perspective. It's give group. Do your best to come to me before winter. Another letter, he writes, bring my pouch and bring my cloak. And he presumes on the generosity. It's family, the household of Onesphorus. It's workplace. Trophimus was ill. Pudens, Claudia, all the brothers. This is, this is real life. This is front line. Some were in the hospital. Some were somewhere else. This isn't just, oh, the message is just for when we meet together in the building. Beyond your comfort zone. Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. We are in the midst of a war zone. Better we stop pretending that we can escape it and get on the front line and fight as God has called us to. But last of all, this personal relationship. He will bring me safely into His kingdom. To Him be the glory forever and ever. His eyes are fixed on Jesus. He breaks out into prayer in the middle of writing and He finishes His letter with prayer. May the Lord be with your spirit. Grace be to you. This receiving of God's word is grace and expressing of prayer that others would know it as well. I pray that we as River of Life would really live this message as we go into 2022. We'd be a church that lives a lifestyle of discipleship, a lifestyle of being changed constantly in our small group settings, large group settings, with our time, talents, and treasures, in our family, in our workplace, going beyond our comfort zone, and all of it springing from a personal relationship where we are receiving His Word secretly, also in a church where there's a leader-follower interaction of trust and honor, and also teaching others as God gives us opportunity to pray for others and to share His Word with others. And we are going to that day 
where we will stand before him. As Paul says here, to his heavenly kingdom. And he will rescue us and bring us safely to that place, those of us who know and love Jesus Christ. And on that day, this will count. These facets of the diamond will extrapolate far beyond the worth of all the diamonds of the earth into a reward and a glory that far outweighs everything. We are living this truth. And as River of Life, may we track this journey together, provoking one another, encouraging one another all the more as we see that day approaching. I'll pray for us, and then I'll give you a heads up for what's coming next week. Father, thank you for this amazing series that has taken such a huge topic like discipleship and distilled it down as we've looked through 1 and 2 Timothy into these seven aspects. Aspects that we see in how you lived with your disciples, calling them to be made fishers of men and commissioning them to make disciples of all nations. That we see in Paul's interaction with Timothy and the early church in Acts, that you call us to be made disciples in a small group setting, in a large group setting, with our talents that you've given us and our treasures. You've called us to outwork it in our families, in our workplace, and even beyond where we feel comfortable, all springing from a vibrant, real relationship with you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be radical, that you would help us to shake off the uh, cares of this world and the weeds that want to tangle around our legs, the sin that so easily entangles us and pulls us back into a desire for comfort, a desire for autonomy, a desire for self. Lord, that you really would help us to break through and to be living radically, being made a disciple and making disciples of others the whole of our lives. Thank you, Lord, for all that is ahead in 2022 and what you're calling us to as a church. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, please do join us next week for uh, the first of a two-part series called New Africa. And this whole discipleship thrust is being outworked in a context of massive change in Africa. And I hope that you're going to hear a voice and you're going to see realities that are going to change the way that we think about the kingdom of God in Zimbabwe and Africa. There are massive opportunities that are before us, if not challenges, opportunities for the gospel. And we're going to hear some great new voices. We're going to learn some great new stuff. Please don't miss next week, the 20th of March. I look forward to seeing you then. God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.